Okay. Uh, is that announcements? Is that children's church today? by justification and regeneration, born again, however you want to say it, or born from above, Jesus gave people who were dead in sins a new birth that issues eternal life. And so the new life in Christ is like the dawning of a new day. A person made alive in Christ who doesn't grant the opportunity to live for Christ is like a person who sleeps uh, on after the day has dawned. Again, uh, uh, in Ephesians 5.14, Paul writes, Awake, sleeper. <laughs> And arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. What in the world does Paul mean when he says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you? What does he mean? First of all, Paul's writing to believers in Ephesus here. He's writing to the church, the people already converted to Christ. And I believe this says to Christians, you and I, once you let Christ awaken you out of sin, which he has, you must not fall back into the slumber of the old way of life. Don't, uh, don't hit the snooze button. It's a warning. 
We need to be alert as believers to look carefully at our inner attitudes, to look at how people influence you for good or for bad, to look at your time in prayer, to keep the faith and your trust in Jesus for eternal life. Nowhere in God's word can I find where it says it's easy. I just can't find it. Remember I shared before my favorite license plate ever that I saw was on a car that says, where the heck is Easy Street? And folks, it doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. Many of us have, have received Jesus as our personal Savior. And that's a wonderful thing. We're going to heaven because of it. We have eternal life. What a gift. Making him Lord of our lives is a totally different story. Number one today, my first point here today, probably already thought I was on my first point, but I'm on my first point now. Now is the time to let Jesus Christ be Lord of your lives. Paul tells us in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on. It means we have to do something. Put on. This illustration seems to be this, that the old evil deeds of a person's life before he or she became a Christian are like old clothes that need to be discarded. We're, we're to enfold ourselves in the Lord Jesus like wrapping ourselves in a robe, to live in a manner of life approved by our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians and Colossians, two epistles that Paul wrote a few years later uh, than Romans from his Roman, Roman prison, he developed this idea. And listen to Paul's instructions from these verses. I don't mind reading a lot of scripture, because scripture says a lot more than I can say. Ephesians 4, 22 through 32, says Paul writes this to the Ephesians, to Ephesus. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, <coughs> which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And put on the new self. Again, we have to do something. Put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Verse 26, be angry, and yet not do, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You know, we do get angry at times. Sometimes it's for a good reason. But the Lord is, the Lord got angry, didn't he? Remember he went into the temple, flipped the table, kicked everybody out of the synagogue? You're making my house a, 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 a den of thieves? He said, get out. And so there's a righteous anger. But sometimes we can get angry for other reasons. Just don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with whatever anger you. Do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer. There's no thieves in the building. But rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he'll have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Did you know we're living in a very hurting world? People need to hear the good news. People need to hear that you care for them. 30, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We are sealed in him. Isn't that wonderful? Nobody can take us away from God. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Boy, that's a heavy line. In the last verse there, 32, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Paul threw that in there, didn't he? Forgiving each other, just as God in Christ is also forgiving you. You know, this is usually Communion Sunday because of the meeting after I'm going to have it next Sunday. Christianity is really about eternal life and forgiveness, isn't it? From Genesis to Revelation, the, the, the Bible is all about eternal life. Colossians 3, 1 through 17, I'm not going to read all that, just two of the verses uh, uh, say the same thing, but it says, two, verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. All of us 
and I mean all of us, everyone here in this building today who are called Christians must die to our self, to our old nature. And all of us, folks, all of us are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. I believe the scriptures. It's the only infallible truth that's in this world today is the Holy Bible. Now is the time, folks. Now is the time to let Jesus Christ be Lord of your life, of my life. As Paul suggests, the change of our clothes needs to be complete. None of the old clothes of an unsaved person will look good on one who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you able to follow me today? Amen. Amen. In doing so, we make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Romans 3.14. A lot of scripture today. One who expects to live the Christian life with only partial allegiance to Jesus Christ, needs to rededicate his or her life to give him full allegiance. Jesus knows nothing about second place. He never ended second. He should always be first. Amen. You know, the order of things in a Christian's life is God first, family second, God third. Because if we put God first, he's going to take care of everything else in our life, somehow, some way. Partial allegiance is like putting on partially good clothes and partially dirty clothes. I'm sure so, I'm sure you've all heard the saying, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Now you don't have to be some holy roller rolling down the aisle. I've never seen anybody roll down the aisle, have you? Yeah. No. But I did once in BBS, but that's a different story back home. Uh, Jesus himself says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord? Now Jesus said this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Good question. Please, don't get too uptight here, thinking you have to carry a burden that's too heavy for you to make Jesus Lord of all. Jesus himself teaches us in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. This is why I put it on our sign up front. Jesus said, I love these verses. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Yeah. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, if, if, if God put it in his word for the things that we need to do, not to be saved, it's because we're saved. You'll be able to do it. Because the Lord would never ask us to do something that we couldn't do. I just love those words from uh, learn from me, he says. I could almost hear his gentle voice and the way he would tell people. You know, uh, our Jewish friends were trying to keep the law. Okay, the Ten Commandments. They're trying to keep it, and it's like a thousand pound weight on them. Because nobody can keep the law. Somebody breaks the law. Everyone in this building has broken some of the commandments. Now, if you're really good, you only broke maybe two of them. If you're in the middle, maybe you broke five of them. I don't know. That's between you and God. But know that you're, <coughs> you're failing the law, not keeping it is nailed to the cross. See the beauty of all that? But Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to get rid of it. I came to fulfill it. Why? Because you and I can't fulfill it. So he fulfilled it for us. That's not even in my notes. That's all free stuff. That's, that's beautiful. It really is. We couldn't keep the law, so he kept it for us. You know, Satan tries to trip up Christians who, who don't plan to continue, uh, who plan, excuse me, excuse me. Satan tries to trip up Christians who do not plan to continue in the temporary pleasures of sin. And sin is a pleasure for a season, let's, let's admit it. You see, when Christians do stumble, that's you and me, we stumble towards Christ and find forgiveness. However, those who profess to be Christian yet plan on purposely and go on sinning are already deceived about their condition. No. And they're deceiving others. Please, totally understand that God forgives, and when he forgives, he forgets. Past sin. Did you believe that this morning? No matter what you've done in your life, when you came to Christ and asked him to forgive you, he forgave you and he forgot it as far as the east is from the west. Believers need to also forget them. As people who just cannot, they refuse. They refuse to forget the things that have happened in the past. They refuse. Your past sins shouldn't be buried as to putting on new clothes, or putting on the Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and Paul, I'm going to tell you how to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. And here's an apostle who wrote 13 books in the Bible. And he says he hasn't arrived yet. But one thing I do, he said, one, but he said, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on in life toward the goal of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. In verse 12 of our Romans and 13, Paul writes for us to put on the armor of light. It's in our text today. Night and day, darkness and light are metaphors for Satan and Christ, the flesh and the spirit. The armor of light represents the qualities of character with which the believer should equip or, uh, for him and her to battle for Jesus against evil in this world. And believe me, there's a lot of evil. In Ephesians, Paul expanded on this illustration as he illustrates the six main pieces of soldier's equipment. The Christian side, that's another sermon in itself. The belt, the breastplate, the boots, the shield, the helmet, and the sword. Uh, uh, you know, you put on the full armor of God. He uses them as pictures of the truth, righteousness, good news of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God, which we equip us in our fight against the powers and the principalities. You know, I love it, and I can't quote chapter and verse, because I forgot chapter and verse, of our enemy. You know, Satan is a real, a real thing. And all his little demons. The scriptures teach us that Jesus made a show of them open, triumphant over them. And we need to remember that no matter what we see the evil, no matter what's going on in this world, we are triumphant over them in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to go back to Romans 13 for a moment. Paul writes in verse 13, let us behave properly as in the day. Other versions are saying they walk honestly. Any verse you have is telling us as Christians to walk honestly. To behave properly, which both mean to live decently. Because the Christian's walk is open in the day for everybody to see. As a matter of fact, we are referred to as living epistles read by all men. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, 3. If you're a confessed believer, you're a living epistle. Did you know that? Did you know that when you leave this building that the church goes with you? Because you're the church, not the building. <coughs> okay? Anyway, so now is the time. It's an awake sleeper. Paul is saying awake sleeper. There's too much uh, mediocrity. There's too much lack of joy and excitement in the church of Jesus Christ today. I'm talking, not, I'm not talking just here, I'm talking universal, I'm talking worldwide, it's too much. Look what he's done for us, and people say, oh yeah, I go to church, it's like punching a time clock and going home. A wake sleeper, Paul says, now is the time, he says, to let Jesus be Lord of your life. But uh, to what, my second point is, why put on Christ? Why accept him as Lord? Because you're saved, he saved you, yeah. So why make him Lord if you're going to heaven? Why do that? Why? Because he is Lord. <coughs> Peter preached at Pentecost. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, his Jesus, whom you crucified. Acts 2.36. Why? Because he has a right to be Lord. For if we live, he writes, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Why make him Lord? Because he is worthy to be Lord. Praise God. Jesus is true. Yeah. He's life, he's love, he is righteousness. Jesus Christ never asked his followers to do anything contrary to the truth, love, or righteousness. He never asked us to do anything that we cannot do. <laughs> to accept his lordship is wise and is right, and it's in the center of the will of God for your life and for my life. Church. We need to be excited about heaven, do we not? We need to be excited that a Savior died for us. We need to be greater than, uh, excited because greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Amen. Why? 
take him, Lord, because the only way to be truly happy is to accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Allow me to comment on this. You have to allow me, because I got the microphone. <laughs> it's my half hour, or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to comment to say an unsaved person can never be fully happy. Yes, there's a lot of happiness on his hand, but not fully. Because a person who does not know that Jesus Christ is Savior is lost, and there'll be a missing link in their life forever. Isaiah 48, 22 bears this out. He said, there is no peace for the wicked, meaning the unsaved. Says the Lord, the satisfactions of this world can no more satisfy the longing of the soul than the hog's food can satisfy the need of the prodigal's time. I was thinking last night, Angie and I were both had a little trouble sleeping last night, so we watched the Braves and the Dodgers game. And I won't go into why I don't like the Dodgers. So we vote for the Atlanta Braves. Everybody down south, be happy, y'all. Uh, and they, the Braves won, so they're independent playing the Houston Astros. And, and uh, but the, the reaction after they got that last stop, they're all jumping out of each other on the mound, they're celebrating the show. They've done a wonderful thing. You know how temporary that is? I know why that's me, so forget it. If you get what they can lose the World Series, well, whatever. But things. Things in life can make you happy. I got my 50 inch screen TV. I was very happy. Temporary. Everything's temporary. We had that house we bought in Massachusetts. We were very happy. Okay? But everything is temporary. Christ is eternal. So we should have so much joy in us that He died for us. And we have each other 75 years old. I don't know how many more days, months, years God is going to give me. But it, I, I know that it's eternal. Once I close these eyes in death, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. Then he asked Martha, he said, do you believe this, Martha? Mama. Yes, I believe this. He said, even the dead shall hear my voice. Do you lose a loved one that's, that knows Christ as their Savior? They're in heaven. They're in heaven now. And you will see them again. Why do you meet my friend? who try to compromise are the most miserable people on the face of the earth. They have too much religion to enjoy the world's pleasures and are too worldly to experience the joys of a faithful Christian. That kind of person is like the man who in the Civil War wanted to proclaim his neutrality. So he wore a blue coat and gray pants. The Confederates shot him in the coat, the Yankees shot him in the pants. Neutrality with reference. To Jesus Christ is denial. You can't be neutral. You can't be sitting on the fence. In fact, God says you sit on the fence, you're in the middle. I spew you out of my mouth. Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 12, 30, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. We need to make Jesus Lord awake sleepers. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. I'm involved. I preach to myself. Dear people of God, those who truly make Jesus Christ the Lord of their lives are a thoroughly happy people. The attitudes describe the characteristics of a citizen of God's kingdom or a Christian disciple. Jesus calls this person blessed or blessed, which means happy. Blessed are those who mourn, really mourning for those who don't know Christ. Blessed are those who do this. Blessed are, are those who do this. You're happy. Jesus calls us happy and blessed. In the upper room, Jesus washed his disciples' feet and spoke with them about accepting his lordship and serving others in his name. And he added, if you know, know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So, how do I do those things? Big question. How do I do those things? How do I put on the Lord Jesus Christ? How do I make him lord of my life? Well, let me say that it's a, 
uh, a Wilco you to do this. Number one, you lay aside the old self. In fact, you don't get involved in the sin that you used to be involved in. Two, you be renewed in the spirit of your mind that Christ is Lord over all. Three, you put on a new self. You put on a new self. You're a new person in Christ. Your attitudes change. Your thinking changes. You want to do the will of God. Oh, yeah, you fail at times, but he picks you up. Four, you speak truth. Five, you speak no unwholesome words from your mouth. Six, you put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. Let me tell you, folks, if you've never forgiven somebody that's offended you, you better do it now. Okay? Because it is right on the top of God's list. And I have a few in my life. And I'm sure uh, I have to be forgiven by other people for some things in the past. But uh, this is what we do. It says you, you, you. You put. You lay aside. You put on. It's choices we have to make every day. You be kind. It says tender hearted. Number seven, I love that. Eight, you forgive others as God has forgiven you. Nine, you forget what lies behind. And ten, you press on toward the goal, Paul writes, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We press on. Every day we press on. Every day is a different journey. Every day there's new issues in life. Every day something seems to pop up. Our whole family is upset yeah, now with Rita, uh, about Rita. We're, we're, we're crying and we're praying and everything else, but we need to press on. God has surrounded Rita. God's hand is on me that the Holy Spirit is in that room and in her heart with her. She's a believer. And the things we have to face in life, which are not easy. You and I, who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, belong to him. Get excited about that. Because you should be excited and make him Lord. That's our to-do list. And it's all... The ball's in your court. It's your will. I will to please God. Now, I don't want to sound, uh, what's the word? Contradictory. But then in Romans chapter 7, Paul writes, this great man of God, St. Paul, Paul, whatever you want to call him. So I love to do the things of God, but I hate the very things I do. Paul, what are you saying to me? He's saying to me that just like me, he's just like me, that he has to fight sin in his life. He said, who will deliver me from this cursed man that I am? He says, thank you, Lord, but our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you do stumble, when you don't, when you miss the mark, that's what sin means, you miss the mark. So he said, God, I'm sorry if you mean it, because if you don't notice when you miss the mark, then you're in trouble spiritually. But I think a believer knows when we sin. If you don't, see me after the service. Oh, after the meeting. No, I don't see me at all. <laughs> These things are on your to-do list, people. My to-do list. They're evidence of you making him Lord of your life. In my life. I want Jesus to be my Lord. Yeah. Why? Because he is worthy of it. He deserves it. I have a word <laughs> Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent us as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. The day of the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming back. Now that's how the church is such a me, me, me generation. Instead of you, you, and you, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What can I do for you? Did you know that Jesus died to pay for your sin? What's that? What's that? People call it some kind of disorder. Sin is missing the mark. The, stand on the standards that God set, the standards he set are found in the law. Yes, 
accepted Christ and paid for our shortcomings and our sin. We're back to our main text today in Romans 13. Paul instructs us, do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken, to awaken your sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us. Salvation refers to all that God has already done. It is past. Ephesians 2 bears that out. Salvation, sanctification, and growth in grace is not present. That's our stage right now. <coughs> sanctification means you set apart for God. Salvation is glorification, the eternal state is future. But the past, present, and future all that are in our salvation. Make Jesus the Lord of our church. Amen. I'm talking church universal now, not just the Great Assembly of God. Wake up, sleepers. Christ is coming back to this church. We are the bride of Christ, and we need to remember ourselves for his coming. And then you all want to hear those words. All want to hear those words. When you meet Jesus face to face. Well done, my truly faithful servant. And then the heart. See, that's why I'm training and hugging now. I'm doing pretty good right now. I'm doing better. I'm really is. I'm doing much better. And uh, I'd be a fool to see those cousins get up with women and not hug her more often. Right? Amen. Amen. But I, I, mean, I, I don't mind it. But I want that hug to exist. Like, well done, my friend. See, my friend, you are a friend. But well done anyway. You know, I just want to hear, don't you want to hear those words? Well done, Rebecca Scotty, Rodney Scotty, Jack Scotty. Welcome, Angela Hardy. Welcome, John Ailes. All these. I go through the whole thing, but sometimes I'll forget a first name, so I don't want to blow it. Corinne, let's come up. We'll sing that song. Um, can you get back to it on your 